So my name is Kate Storey. I'm, I'm a professor of cell and developmental biology at the University of Dundee, and I'm going to chair today's seminar. Um, so this is one of the, this is the second uh, HDBR seminar on um, human embryology and ethics. Um, we set up these sessions so they're intended to be facilitating a respectful discussion about this is what is sometimes a contentious uh, topic um, related to developmental biology research. And what we're aiming for here is an open and inclusive and safe environment in which we can uh, explore ideas and understand, uh, come to new understandings. So we encourage active participation and we've allowed plenty of time uh, for questions and discussion at the end. There are going to be two speakers today uh, on our topic of human embryos and developmental biology, history and ethics. Uh, our first speaker is Professor Nick Hopwood, who is Professor of the History of Science and Medicine at the University of Cambridge. And Dr. Sarah Chan is our second speaker, uh, and she's a reader in bioethics at the Usher Institute at the University of Edinburgh. So Nick's going to speak first for 20 minutes, and then Sarah will follow on uh, and, and speak for a further 20 minutes, and then we'll open the floor for discussions. So I want to begin by just introducing briefly Nick and then handing over to him to give his talk. So Nick began his career actually as a developmental biologist, and then he progressed to researching the history of, uh, the history of embryology. He's written numerous books on this topic, including Haeckel's Embryos, Images, Evolution and Fraud, which won the Leveson Prize for the from the History of Science Society. He recently co-edited Reproduction, Antiquity to the Present Day, which is now out in paperback, if you're interested. And he is currently working on a further book, Dramas of Development, Imaging Life Before Birth, A History of Visualizing Human Embryos. Nick holds a Leverhulme major research fellowship, which, which supports his research for and writing of a new book, the Many Births of the Test Tube Baby, A History of Claims of IVF. He's going to talk to us today about human embryo research from Carnegie Department to the HDBI. Thanks very much, Kate. I hope you can um, hear me and see my screen okay. And um, thanks very much to all of you for coming. Um, have you ever wondered? Uh, how come there is such a field as human developmental biology? Why are there people like you doing what you do? That's what I'd like to explore today, to see what we can learn from the answers and th the comparisons that they draw between the present and the past. Now, research on human embryos goes back a few centuries, but for the 20-minute version, I'm going to focus on the last 100 years. I'm going to divide this into uh, three periods, period of dominance of the Department of Embryology of the Carnegie uh, Institution of Washington, a period of marginalization of human embryology, and uh, the revival uh, of this field as something different, human developmental biology. And I'm going to suggest that we get a stronger sense of human developmental biology by comparing and contrasting it with what went before by thinking about collecting, image making, staging, communicating the results, relations with donors and audiences, and, and thinking about the infrastructures that have made those possible. And we'll see that a lot has changed, but that much of what you're doing builds on what went before. That's not always acknowledged. I mean, we all need to claim novelty, and we don't all like old books. But in reflecting on what you're doing, I, I hope I can persuade you that the past is a fantastic resource. So I want to start with the Carnegie era, um, the department that institutionalized the approach to human embryology that had been developed in late 19th century Germany, above all by the anatomist Wilhelm Hiss. A normal plate, provided a framework for ordering new specimens, collected mostly from miscarriages and abortions, though also the occasional post-mortem and increasingly gynecological operations. The more important preparations were serially sectioned and reconstructed as commercially sold wax models. 
And the anatomists who did this human embryology, they really prided themselves on studying human embryos. They were reacting against what they saw as the, the excesses of comparative evolutionary embryology and rather disparaged the use of the chick and domestic mammals to fill in the gaps. His, his American student, Franklin Mole, got the money from the Carnegie Institution of Washington, a major private funder before the federal government got much involved in science. Mole got the money to set up this Department of Embryology at the Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore. Mole promised medical benefits in relation to the causes of miscarriages, infertility, malformations, and other pathologies. He also wanted a more rational anatomy. As he put it, gross human anatomy is bankrupt. It is made solvent through embryology. And there was also a, an impetus simply to know ourselves unborn. Now, what we're seeing in this uh, rather staged photograph, I don't think they wore bow ties uh, every day, even in those days. Um, uh, what we're seeing is the fireproof vault where the Carnegie embryologists amassed some 10,000 specimens. Um, those that have been sectioned in the cabinets on the left and the records on the right. Now they collect from medical school alumni, clinical colleagues, fairly transparently among the professionals, but the patients were largely unaware of what was going on. Most of the preparations uh, still came from uh, miscarriages or induced abortions, but the best from operations. This is the record for one of those. We have it because it was reproduced in an article. They were proud uh, of this one in particular because they had obtained uh, the preparation live from an operation and injected it with the heart still beating with India ink. Now, you might notice that under uh, nationality of mother, uh, towards the top here, it says in the language of the time, Negro. The department did have a project in uh, racial embryology, as they called it, but that was a fairly minor strand. They mostly worked blind as to race and sex. Now, they serially sectioned and reconstructed many hundreds of embryos. Uh, here we're seeing four views of one model, uh, stage 10. So they photographed sections on the cut surface of the block, uh, magnified those on wax plates, uh, cut them out, stacked them up, and filled the hole with plaster and then removed the wax. You can see they left the models unsmooth. And this produced a lot of information about development, uh, also of organ systems. But there was a lot they couldn't do. So in the 1920s, they developed a side project uh, which turned monkeys, uh, rhesus macaques, into laboratory organisms for studies of embryology and the menstrual cycle. They became adept at what they sometimes called monkey gynecology, which was really very invasive. It's, it, it's um, almost more disturbing than what they did to the uh, women patients. But it did provide the first direct evidence for mid-cycle ovulation and let them film the early stages. They could do nothing like this for human embryos. Um, they'd still never seen those between fertilization uh, and the end of the second week. How to emulate the monkey work when they couldn't treat women quite like monkeys even then? Answer, uh, take advantage of routine gynecological surgery to take more control. So this is the so-called Boston egg hunt. Between 1938 and 1954, the pathologist Arthur Herty and the gynecologist John Rock, they were at Harvard Medical School, they collaborated with the Carnegie Department to retrieve human specimens through the first two weeks. Rock selected women of known high fertility who were waiting for non-urgent hysterectomies, operations to remove the uterus women who menstruated regularly and who lived with their husbands and, as he put it, were willing and intelligent enough to cooperate. The decision on the operation was separate from the research project, though some of the same surgeons were involved. Now, cooperation meant 
reporting each menstrual period during the months of waiting uh, using postcards and then having unprotected sex on a particular day in the run-up to the operation. Rock's assistant, Miriam Menkin, explained the project and encouraged the, the patients. Now, that would, of course, be unethical today, and it was tricky then, especially since Rock and most of the patients were Catholic and abortion was illegal. But medical power was then at its peak, and this was before informed consent. It did give them the chance of finding something real. This is a photograph and a drawing of the Harvard egg at 12 days. There's a whole history of how they named these, these, these embryos. Um, researchers today sometimes dismiss all this as grainy photos, but this was high quality printing in the journal Contributions to Embryology with drawings by one of the best medical artists. It wasn't secret. There was some re reporting of it, but Hertig called the more or less uh, planned approach. Um, what, what he called that, it, it was somewhat ethically delicate at the time, and by the 1970s had become very hard to justify in retrospect. In their defense, they said they didn't know whether or not the women were actually pregnant, so it wasn't like they were performing abortions to order. Meanwhile, the former director, George Streeter, set up horizons, uh, initially for later embryos, um, what become the Carnegie stages. Now, the term horizon reflected his wariness of the term stage uh, because of the problem of normal variation, which meant that um, there was no uh, single seriation, that could, no single series that could be set up. Street to sidestep this by defining age groups based on point scores, often for internal criteria, like you can see here in the development of the eye. He later decided that stage was okay because there was enough correlation in the development of the different organ systems. Street to took the timings from the macaques. That became controversial. By the 1960s, it seemed they were, they were rather too fast. Um, which is one of the things that was, re was revised when Ronan O'Reilly and Fabiola Muller competed the staging project in 1973. Now, the primary audience um, for all this were um, fellow researchers and medical students, um, but they put effort also into diffusion and popularization, as they called it, including providing photos for reproduction in leading magazines. So here, uh, some of the Rock and Hertig uh, embryos along the bottom and uh, a prize-winning photo of 40-day embryo uh, at the top. Even while this work was going on, though, um, research on human embryos was already starting to be marginalized at the Carnegie Department. And we can see that um, if we look at uh, the director's annual reports. So one is referring already in 1941 to diminishing returns because traditional descriptive morphology of human embryos was seen as basically finished. So even at the department founded to research them, uh, this was de demoted to an ancillary position. More positively, I suppose one might say that James Abbott uh, saved the department from closure by completing a refocusing onto experimental, cellular, molecular, and genetic studies that were better pursued in more accessible species. In 1973, the human embryo collection was hived off to the University of California at Davis. And this was part of making developmental biology as a new field in the 1950s, a field that intended to expand the scope of experimental embryology across the whole living world. Though, it increasingly concentrated on a few organisms, especially mice, which were only now established as the model mammal. I should say that developmental biology wasn't the only game in town. Uh, anatomists carried on with descriptive human embryology. There was clinical work on fetuses, including now using ultrasound, and in vitro fertilization was made a line of research, as I'll say a bit more about in a minute. But human embryology overall spent much of the post-war period in decline. Now, fortunately, that isn't the end of the story, as you know. 
the history of studying human embryos directly is almost cyclical with uh, rise, then decline, and then with new opportunities uh, arise again. And human developmental biology is the latest incarnation and, and a new one, at least that's my argument. I, I should say that like science, history isn't done once and for all. It needs improvement and revision. Um, I'm giving you a first stab at one that hasn't been written yet, and I'm hoping that you can help me improve it. Anyway, what I think is that um, one of the things that promotes change is uh, because developmental biology changes in the 1990s with critiques of over-reliance on model organisms and genomics opening other organisms up for analysis. Another context is uh, new pressure in the 1990s for translation or medical benefits. This went along with the rise of external regulation and stakeholder involvement, which accompanied the decline of medical power. There's also a diversification of personnel, especially as a result of, of feminism and, and other general changes. The two main strands of technical innovation, I think, are in vitro culture systems for embryos and stem cells and post-genomic methods for mapping gene expression part of a larger visual turn in biomedicine. And all that means that human developmental biology is not just human embryology by another name. It builds on Carnegie embryology, makes similar arguments, uses related techniques, but it's different because, well, the world has changed. So looking at first at culture, um, pre-implantation embryos could now be obtained from IVF clinics. Following the achievement of a live birth from IVF in 1978, the UK government set up the Warnock Committee, which recommended allowing research under strict licensing regime up to 14 days. And after a lot of parliamentary and public debate, this was enshrined in the Human Fertilization and Embryology Act 1990 with a 14 day limit that, as you'll know, is now under some pressure. I will just mention, uh, stem cell models as another dimension of innovation in culture systems. I'm sure you're familiar with, with embryoids and, and organoids and so on. The other set of innovations is in mapping. And initially, uh, anatomists digitized old slides. Um, the first projects in the 1990s were at the National Museum of Health and Medicine in Washington, DC. Uh, that's where the Carnegie uh, collection had moved from uh, UC Davis. And they obtained uh, NIH contracts uh, that looked forward to a world of cooperation between what they called uh, institutions using wide bandwidth image transmission technologies. So I suppose, you know, the kind of thing that we're rather used to in the age of the internet. And these visible embryo projects digitize some of the old slides, they produce 3D images, videos, fly-throughs, using technology from the animation and gaming industries. You may be more familiar with the later Dutch uh, 3D digital actors, also produced in part using the Carnegie slides. And there's now an international digital embryology consortium. But for gene expression studies, um, you need fresh or frozen material. Um, and this is really, I think, where human developmental biology as a project, as well as a name, really comes from. Human geneticists in Newcastle were interested in congenital malformations and wanted to study gene expression by in situ hybridization, immunocytochemistry, and 3D reconstruction. Now, they had to make a case against skeptics. Uh, this is uh, what a referee of an early grant application is supposed to have said. Why bother studying gene expression in human embryos? when they're difficult to obtain and can't tell us anything we couldn't learn from studying plentiful mouse embryos. Responding to that, the Newcastle group tried to set up a win-win. Uh, if gene expression is the same in human and mouse, that's very important, as they said, because it confirms the relevance of the mouse model. And if the expression is different, well, it's also very important because it shows that you have to study humans to understand what makes us human, or at least not mice. Now for a systematic approach, they needed an infrastructure to secure the embryo supply and pool results. So they got together with the uh, group at the Institute of Child Health in London, 
um, to found the Human Developmental Biology Resource, funded by a series of Wellcome and MRC grants from 1999. They called it Human Developmental Biology, to perhaps to avoid the connotations of embryo research, which could be controversial, and it perhaps appealed that it, this assimilated the field to developmental biology rather than developmental anatomy. So this is now ethical collecting from gentle ultrasound guided terminations or medical abortions within the framework of the Abortion Act 1967, informed consent and the separation of clinical procedure from research. It's also a new way of making material available and sharing results. In the Carnegie era, researchers had traveled to central collections. Now material is distributed and results are uploaded. But the techniques still rely on the 19th century principle of serial sectioning and reconstruction, but using light sheet microscopes and all the rest. And this paves the way for uh, the uh, HDBI that you know. Now I'm showing this, um, and, and many of you know it far better than me, um, to highlight a final contrast to the Carnegie era how public engagement, not just unidirectional popularization, is built into the project to secure donor consent and wider public support. And how ethics is not um, about just legal requirements, but also researcher education. I hope it's not um, presumptuous to suggest that history might have uh, more of a role to play. Why do I say that? Um, coming to my my last slide, um, I promised that comparing and contrasting human developmental biology with what went before would give a clearer sense of what human developmental biology is. And here's what strikes me from comparing two periods when there are two periods when the argument succeeded for studying human embryos directly rather than via surrogates. Collecting remains limiting, of course, but it's importantly different um, in sources and organization. Uh, the resources are not concentrated in one collection, but distributed, and collecting is within a regulatory framework, which means that engagement work. By the 1950s, people at the Carnegie are wondering if descriptive human embryology was finished. Uh, in the 80s, O'Reilly would say, well, you know, there's actually still quite a lot more to do on the fetus. In human developmental biology, uh, there's perhaps most talk about the black box around and after implantation as a gap in knowledge. Both eras have their surrogates, which are also used, though, though those have changed. Imaging techniques are still fundamentally about sections and reconstruction as developed in the mid 19th century, but transformed by molecular biology, new microscopes and digital infrastructure. And I suppose the Carnegie stages could be the most frequent reminder of the past of the field. Now, I've just scratched the surface today, but I hope I've done enough to persuade you that a historical perspective sharpens our sense of what is distinctive about human developmental biology. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Nick.